man may not know it, and most don't, but they need to be reconciled to their God. The reason being, since sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, 1 John 3, 4. Transgression of the law is sin. All have sinned. Death is the consequence. Death simply means separated from God, dead to God, and all things holy. So a reconciliation is needful. When two have become alienated and estranged, from one another. But which one sets out the terms of reconciliation? And which one must be reconciled to the other? The answer to that is the one that did wrong. In this case, the one that sinned, the one that violated God's law. That one must be reconciled to the one who's right, always has been right, ever will be right. Or we may substitute a word that is certainly biblical, the righteous God. Man needs to be brought to the realization that as he stands on his own, he stands separated from God. In our materialistic world, men do not give much thought to God or man's relationship to God. Thus, they're not pricked in their heart when they say they're separated from God. They don't know really what you're even talking about. And when you speak of the need for sinful man, men who left God by transgression of God's will, that they need to be reconciled to God for they left God by their transgression. That doesn't bother them because they don't understand sin. If anything, they joke about it, make cartoons about it, make light about it. People who embrace it, they consider backward and ignorant and not enlightened. Thus, they give very little thought. Now, that person may live a good life because being a human being, they have morality that can flow from them. But even then, usually it'll be perverted. But a man can be honest with other men and not be honest with himself toward God. A man may pay his bills, provide for his family, etc., and yet be estranged from God. So it was by man's sin that we became alienated from God, cut off from Him. Listen to Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy, that it cannot save. Here. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Again, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. So I think it's quite obvious for those that believe in God as the Bible presents him, understands the truth of the Bible, realizes what man is, that man sees on his own, he's estranged from God. He's cut off from God. He's without God in the world. He's not blessed by God in the sense of being blessed spiritually. In other words, he's not saved from his sins. God remained righteous, though. As I said a moment ago, he's right. He always has been right. In him is light, and there's no darkness at all. 
He's the source of all good and all truth. He is light. If he then were to become reconciled to us, he would have to leave the position of righteousness or right doing or his very essence and being to lower himself, to leave his very holy nature and condescend to us. And that would certainly ruin all things. And we're so very happy that it's impossible for God to deny himself for he is just what he is. He is righteous. He is holy. And that's just what he is. So it was for God really to set forth the terms by which man might regain that great and wonderful plane of righteousness from which he by transgression fell. So it's man that must do the changing. It must come to the resolution that I have by my own actions or the lack thereof sinned against God and separated myself from God. So I, as a man and all men, have changed the state and the relationship that once we had in our innocency with God. But God remains holy and righteous for that's just what he is. Jesus said, therefore, to the people of his day in his earthly ministry, the Jews, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I have the ability, for God gave me that. It's built in, if you want to call it that, in the creation of me as a human being and you, to change, to come to grips with the way I am and whether that state of being is in harmony with God or whether it's not to recognize my transgression and that it separated me from God and then to repent. Repent is the change. It results in the change. So reconciliation rested on man's willingness to change. If you don't want to change, you won't. If you do want to change, you will. And that's the point that is made when preachers preach repent. It was the cry of the prophets it was the cry of John the baptizer, the one who came before the Christ of the Jews. It was the cry of Jesus and his apostles. It's the cry of every faithful evangelist of Christ to all men estranged from God that they have the power to resist the truth, therefore resist God, or to realize they're in a state of being cut off from God in need of reconciliation, and they can change to come to God. Of course, it must be on God's terms. We haven't said anything about that yet, but it must be on God's terms. But before we get to that, let's look at how God chose His only begotten Son to act in reconciling the world to Him. Certainly there's no man as faithful as Abraham or as faithful as the Apostle Paul, they could not act as the agent because all human beings have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thus, no human being as such could do that. So we're the offenders as the race of man. God is the, for lack of a better way to put it, an innocent person. He is eternal. He is right, he's righteous, he's holy. No man can approach him. He is light, he is truth, he is love. Now when he created man back there in the beginning in his own likeness, then there is a spirit within man, man that's fathered by God and made in his likeness, his moral likeness. The rational powers to think, to evaluate, to draw conclusions. To have a sense that a thing ought to be a certain way or ought not be a certain way. Where does that come from? It comes from a spirit made in the image of God, the moral likeness of God. 
But it takes the revelation of God in His Word, the gospel of Christ, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16, to show us how that works. And as we study it, the first thing we see, there wouldn't be any gospel, good news, glad tidings, if there wasn't a Christ. Listen to what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse number 7 along this line. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. This is speaking of Christ. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, likening Christ's work to the high priest under the law of Moses. Remember, he went once a year into the most holy place to offer blood upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for his own sins and the sins of all the people. So he was a type, a shadow of the Christ to come. So he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for sin for the sins of his people. Hebrews 2:17. Therefore, conclusion we draw from this. It was said of Jesus Christ and this brings us into our studies on John the last couple, three weeks. He was set forth to be a propitiation, an appeasement to God. Who? Christ. Through faith in his blood, blood shed from a sinless body on the cross of Calvary, shed for the remission of sins. To declare his righteousness, remember what we said for those in the class on Wednesday night concerning Jesus Christ, the righteous. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Then you drop down a little further, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Romans 3, 25 through 26. Now it's in that same context that we quoted most often, verse 23, all of sin come short of the glory of God. God's righteous nature is appeased only when one turns from sin, but not just that, accepts from the heart and humble obedience the righteousness that is only in Christ Jesus. But without a changed nature, man cannot stand justified before God. Here's why. Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity or hate against God. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind. We use the word carnal today to mean something usually kind of dirty. But carnal really means a mind that works strictly without the revelation of God to guide it. It's moved strictly by the natural things, not the supernatural. Now, I don't know how to be moved by the supernatural, except the supernatural, which is God, reveals His will for me, and I accept it and live according to it. Now, that's how I walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It's the only way anybody can. You think for a minute when Saul of Tarsus headed on to continue his great persecution of the church is brought to belief in Christ. Saul? Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now watch his response. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, who thou persecutest. Now let's say it stopped right there. Saul even sees the Lord because he wants him to be an apostle and one to be an apostle must see the resurrected Lord. So he now accepts Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. But what if it stops right there? What's he going to do about it? What good does that do him? It's a beginning point, but that's all it is. An important beginning point. If you don't undervalue it, you must begin there as far as belief in Christ is concerned. And for those of us today, when we understand the word of truth, then 
we have faith in God and Christ created within us, Romans 10, 17. But if it stops there, I'm only, according to James, at the devil level of belief, accepting the fact that Jesus is who he claimed to be. But then Jesus said to Saul, go into the street, call straight in Damascus. And there it will be told thee what thou must do. Well, he already believes in Christ. He's even a step up on simply believing on the basis of the evidence of God's word. He's seen the Christ, the resurrected Christ. But he's still not saved. He's still in his sins. He's still separated from God. He is not reconciled to God. He must hear these words that Christ told him he would hear. Well, Christ, God in particular, to simply sum up the whole Godhead, has put these truths in earthen vessels. It is the church, human beings, that's charged with preaching the gospel to every creature. Christ would not tell him. It was not up to him to tell him the terms of pardon. It was up to a human being who was a Christian to do that. So he says, you go and you'll be told there what you must do. That's imperative. It's obligatory what you must do. And yet every denominational preacher today I know of says, just believe. There's nothing you must do to be saved. Well, Christ said it was. I think he knows how he saves people. I think he knows what it takes on the part of a person for that person to be saved from sin. And here he says to a person who sees the risen Lord, who asks who you are, and he tells them, and he's told what he must do. But he's going to hear it from a man, a member of the church, a preacher whom Christ appeared to to tell him to go. And thus they meet up. And Ananias is the one, and he comes to him, and he tells him why he's there. To make the long story a little shorter, he realizes this man believes in Christ, has repented of his sins. His very actions prove that. He's been fasting three days and three nights and blind and prayer in prayer. And thus, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. In fact, what are you waiting on? Make that final step. There are a host of people in this world today who are right where Saul of Tarsus was. They believe with all their heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and they stop. They stop at the devil level of belief, mentally ascending to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They do not hear him say, do what the New Testament teaches you must do to be saved. And so they remain believers, but not reconciled to God believers but still in their sins so the next verses show the transformation after Romans 8 7 the transformation that takes place when one comes into Christ and thereby is reconciled to God but now don't ask God to become reconciled to the world for reasons we've already established Man must do the changing for he's the sinner, he's the offender in order to be reconciled to God. James wrote to Christians, they had heard the gospel from the heart obeyed it, they were in the church. Yet he states a great truth in James chapter 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity or hate with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, what did he mean? I'm in the world. I'm in the fleshly body. It has needs of this present world. God's anticipated that. He's made us and gives us regulations on how to function in this world and remain faithful to God. What's he talking about? What John's talking about in First John when he talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you can live on that level. 
to the rejection of the revelation of God in His Word as to how we're to live, what we're to believe and how we're to live. So to be reconciled with God, we must turn away from a sin-cursed world to people who will not hear the truth, who are interested in establishing themselves and what they already love of this world rather than change their lives and to view things from God's perspective. Now to see how both Jew and Gentile were reconciled to God, Paul had something to say about that. When he wrote the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Now follow carefully. And maybe later go back and read this. And remember we're talking about sinful man who left God by his own choice being reconciled to the one who's always right. God. Listen to how he wrote. That at that time, when you were outside of Christ, when you were not Christians, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, the time Paul wrote this to those Christians and for all Christians, but now in Christ Jesus. Let me say it again for the umpteenth time. That's a lot of times. In Christ Jesus. A little too little word. In Christ Jesus. But now, in Christ Jesus. What's significant about that? Well, it's in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off or made near by the blood of Christ. Not outside of Christ Jesus, but inside of Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Now notice for he is our peace, who hath made both one, that's Jew and Gentile, even, and hath broken down the middle of all the traditions. That's significant. Very point he's making. Between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, now, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself one new man. So making peace. Now watch it. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross. Having slain the enmity that is the hate thereby. Then he went ahead and say. For through him we both have access to God, both Jew and Gentile. Now Paul is giving an explanation here. While the law of Moses stood as Israel's way of approaching God and worshiping God, it separated the Jews from the Gentiles and the other way around. Well, what's God's design to make all men one? The United Nations, some political party, some human philosophy or human religion, by that I mean originating with man. No. One of the Godhead three would become man. John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14. Would be tempted in every point, like as we are, yet without sin. As the Lamb of God, and they understood perfectly well what that meant in the law, and even back in the patriarchy, for that's what they offered, a Lamb without blemish, as a type of Christ. Thus John would say, when Christ, when he saw Christ coming, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And thus he would go to the cross, die on behalf of others, for there was no sin in him, Offering his body a sacrifice for sin and shedding his blood for the remission of sins. And so we're able to see he made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition. See, he took the law out of the way. It's no longer the authority. And taking the law out of the way, he removed the partition. And thus he makes all men one in one body. 
And yet we learn from Colossians 1.18, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that one body is the church. And Ephesians 4 says there's one body. But the body is the church. And Christ added all saved people and does add all saved people to the church. Acts 2.47. One is baptized into Christ, wherein he locates all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Galatians 3.27, Ephesians 1.3. Thus it is the divine scheme of things to reconcile all men to himself in one body. Now what does that say about people who say the church doesn't make any difference? Doesn't have a thing the world to do with one getting to heaven. Well the Lord thought it did for he purchased it with his blood. I know it is worth the purchase price. And thus he adds all men to the church. What all men? Those who hear and believe and from the heart obey the gospel. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine death, burial, resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, that was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You could just as well say you were reconciled to God in one body by the cross. So as Gentiles were aliens, strangers from God's promises, having no hope without God in the world, it was by and only by Christ's death on the cross as a sinless human being that we can be reconciled to God, put back into a state of righteousness which we by our sins left because Christ paid the price for our justification. Thus faith in Him and His system of salvation, the gospel system, reconciles us to God because it justifies us. Our past sins are cleansed by the blood of Christ, the waters of baptism to the penitent believer. So now he is our advocate before God. Now this will tie in here with much of what we've already studied in John, 1 John on Wednesday night. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. He's the appeasement for our sins. God has appeased himself, if you please. Uh, one of the God had three becoming a human being and overcoming Satan in his own territory. Satan had full access to him to get him to sin, but he didn't. Though he was tempted at every point like as we are. Thus he could go to the cross and die on our behalf, being the propitiation for our sins. The appeasement for our sins. And he says, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. So the word propitiation then connects closely with reconciliation. No propitiation, no reconciliation. No appeasement, no reconciliation. No appeasement, propitiation. And there is no justification. And there's no forgiveness. These are cardinal doctrines of the whole way God through the New Testament system, the biblical system, saves men. And so 1 John 4 verse 10 reads, Herein is love. Not that we love God, but he, that He loved us and sent His Son, now watch it, to be the propitiation for our sins. To be the appeasement. God is appeased. For our sins. So God's done far more than most of us even as Christians think about. But we ought to. We cannot minimize the place of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross when we think of its place and our being reconciled to God. It was God's means of promoting what must be in a person if genuine repentance takes place. And that is sorrow toward God for our sins against him. For that's what works repentance, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Sometimes we as preachers, in fact all the time, we're faithful in our work. And as individual Christians trying to get people to become Christians, we plead and beg with them to become Christians. But they never have sorrow toward God for their sins against God. 
And without that, there's no repentance. That's very important. Because the greatest thing that stands between us and God is our own stubborn will. And until that is broken down and destroyed and it lies crushed beneath our feet, will we change our ways in repentance to obey God. So notice Romans 5, 9 through 10. Much more then, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Notice again the involvement of in Him, through Him, into Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. When you hear and from the heart believe and obey the gospel of Christ, Baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.38. You're now alive, a new creature in Christ. You're of Christ, a Christian, a Christian. How sure will you be made alive eternally in a resurrected body when this old material system is long gone? Because Christ is alive. Raise the dead to die no more. Sitting at the right hand of God, ruling over His kingdom, ever living to make intercession for us. The only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. He lives, the song says. And because He lives, I live. So beyond the death to a life of sin that comes at repentance, there is the life we enjoy when we're new creatures in Christ, having our sins washed away in the waters of baptism. And we're raised to walk a new creature. The blood of Christ continually cleansing us from our sins as we walk in the light as He is in the light, having fellowship one with another. So as we consider how God loved us, John 3.16, we're led to repent and accept God's terms of pardon and reconciliation. Also, when we see what God has in store for those who permanently, continually, and steadfastly, and regularly reject God's terms of pardon, God's terms of being reconciled, when deaf ears are turned to the truth of God, when this life is used not to find God and be reconciled to Him on His terms, but to do as we please, thus hell awaits. The Bible's clear about that. Remember, Christ said more about hell and who's going there than anybody else in the New Testament. That ought to say something to the wise person. But listen to what he said to the Colossians. Colossians 1, 20 and 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, now watch, to reconcile all things to himself. Paul says, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. For what purpose? To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now that's how God sees a faithful Christian. He sees a faithful Christian covered by the blood of Christ. He contacted waters of baptism because that Christian continues faithfully in serving him as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Now if that doesn't give a person who's a faithful child of God strength and hope, I'd let to know what does. The world, even your own family, even your so-called friends oppose you. The government oppose you. Anybody oppose you. But when you know that you have from the heart obeyed the truth and you walk in the light, in the truth, it doesn't make one bit of difference. They can't separate you from God. There's much more that we could say along this line. 
But I want to end by pointing out that one must be in Christ to enjoy these things, to be reconciled to God, to be justified in His sight, to have the wonders of what the blood of Christ can do for you. Thus you lift your voice and you cry out to all men outside of Christ. You plead and you beg. Can't you see your lost condition? Can't you see you're estranged from God? You have no hope you're without God in the world. Even if you've been brought to belief in Christ that He's the Son of God and Savior, but you reject what He says one must do to be saved. Why? Why go that far? Think about that for a minute. Here's a person who appears before Christ at the judgment. Why, well, Lord, I've believed on you for years. Most of my life I've believed you're the Son of God. If he were to respond, I think he would say, well, then why didn't you do what I said? In the way I said it. For the reason I said it. That I might reconcile you unto me. That I could justify you. That I could forgive your sins by the blood I shed. And that you could contact when you would do what I said do. In being baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ as a penitent believer. And yet you stand there walking off into eternal damnation and torment. A believer in Christ. Horror of horrors. Why? Oh, why will you die? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, we close with. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and given us, Paul says, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, I am speaking much here about the work of apostles and of ambassadors of Christ. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing or reckoning their trespasses unto them. Well, I want to be in that state. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ, the apostles. As though God did beseech you by us. That tells you what the ambassador does. He's in a position to state infallibly the position of his government. In this case, King Jesus. And thus, Christ, by those ambassadors, gave us the New Testament. God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, in the place of Christ. Be ye reconciled. To God. In other words, the ball's in my court, your court. And it also says again, you can say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and I believe in Him. And if you stop there, what a shame. For you don't realize the implications of making that profession. That implies what Christ said. If you love me, ye will keep my commandments. It's that simple, John 14, 15. Why reject it and go with the majority when the majority is lost? If you're not a Christian today, we say with Paul, be ye reconciled to God. It must be upon his own terms, the gospel terms as we've studied. To do God's will, to believe in him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ, thereby reconciled to God. As a child of God, if you've stumbled, if you've failed, if you've gone back into sin, you haven't repented of them, now's the time to do that. The day's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Come confessing those sins, praying God for forgiveness, and keep God's law of second pardon. All these things we say to you as we close the lesson. If there's anyone here that needs to obey the truth, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we sing.